Thank you very much. And to lovely Polish ladies. Uh, I'm very honored to be invited to give a talk in this uh, conference. And uh, the topic is, as you see on the, on the slide, so, um, by the way, I'm not as articulate in speaking as Dr. Surin. So I will use the slide, the video slide to, to guide my talk to make it uh, a little bit more succinct. And uh, why do I come up with this talk? Because the organizing committee, especially to Dr. Maru, was asking me to uh, recount my experience as a researcher and also maybe hopefully give some advice uh, to the young researcher, which I'm grateful to you for turning up to listen to my talk. And also uh, the more senior uh, person sitting in front of the visit in particular. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming. And so uh, hopefully I, I uh, could do a right job when you are asked to examine yourself. Uh, that's a big problem, you know. Uh, but, but it's good because, uh, in a way, you, you, you have to step back from yourself and look at your uh, CV critically, what you have done right and what you have done wrong in your life as a researcher. Uh, I won't talk about what I have done wrong. <laughs> I'll say only what I have done right, probably. But uh, I just warned you that uh, it, I could be very biased because I'm a biological scientist, a cell biologist in particular. Uh, so my, my view is very restrictive to biological science. Uh, and also, uh, this is a personal anecdote that I will talk about. Um, not that I intend to press myself, but I'd like you, you to take it as a case study, more or less. So please bear with me, and I apologize beforehand for any shortcoming. Uh, I think to be a successful scientific researcher in particular, you need to uh, be concerned with four elements, uh, four components. Uh, the first one, you know, which is represented by four circles here, uh, is personal characteristic, which will make you to be a competent leader of the research group. And of course, you cannot work alone, especially when you are getting older and um, to, you want to tackle more, more complex uh, research problems. You need teamwork and you need network and you have to be able to have skill, uh, both human skill and technical skill in uh, administer this uh, teamwork. And of course, uh, very important is the organizational characteristic. Uh, like Burapa University, which I'm now affiliated with. Um, you should have an institute norm and also culture. Culture is very important. Uh, teaching culture and research culture. I will elaborate on that later. And of course, uh, research is a, an expensive business. Uh, you need money, and mostly tax money nowadays. Uh, to get funding for your research, and that comes from the government. So you have to be able to know uh, the directions of research that the government is setting up priority, priority, and also funding. So I hope I have time to, to uh, lament, um, using the Dr. word, lamenting, <laughs> complaining, rather than suggesting on that. Uh, okay, so I have a, probably about a nine or 10 point to make. And uh, when the time comes up, uh, please remind me, uh, lady, that I should stop. And I can't stop anywhere uh, you know, during the talk. And then I think uh, the first thing is that, uh, you know, my, I, I read quite a lot of books as well, and, and uh, even being a scientist, I read a lot of uh, the makings of such and such, uh, the making of uh, the president, for example, uh, Kennedy, and so on. And uh, I think uh, also we have a making of a research scientist and a professor. What kind of personality or psyche you should have as a research scientist and professor? And uh, of course, you have to have an inquiring mind. 
And then you have to be inspired by nature. And most of us see the beauty of nature. Like Dr. Surin said very well this morning, that we all an organism, the earthbound organism, we share faith together and we share responsibility. And you must have passion for mechanism. You know, you have to ask yourself why it happened, how does it happen? Starting from the beginning of the universe, the Big Bang, uh, starting from how life is originated, how human being uh, being evolved, so on and so forth. You know, passion mechanism is the key of doing basic research. Actually, it could be said for social science, humanity as well. You know, like a kind of political impasse that we have here, we put what is the mechanism that's going on, how we devise way to overcome it. You know, that's a mechanism in my view. Uh, so passion for learning is also uh, very important. And being open-minded, you know, don't accept anything without evidence. So we are in the career which have to be evidence-based. Of course, get great education, good education and trainings to develop skills is an important step because nowadays knowledge is so vast and that you cannot hope to learn by yourself alone to start with. You know, so you have, you have, you have to have some educational and research background. And most of all, willpower and commitment. You know, uh, I like to watch tennis. I think m many of you also like to watch tennis, you know. Uh, I refer to the speech by uh, Novak Djokovic. Uh, I really don't like him because he's uh, a little bit supercilious, a little bit high head, you know, very, very strong minded. I like the old gentleman more, you know, Federer. <laughs> but I'm very impressed with his intelligence. You know, uh, during uh, last, uh, Australian Open, you know, he was almost defeated by what? Gil Simon. Yeah, during the press conference, he was asked, Do you have doubt in your mind about whether you will be beaten by Gil Simon? He said, that, Of course, I have doubt. You know, everybody have doubt in their career, in their life, you know, but whether you, you will uh, overcome it is a matter of. Uh, uh, whether you are satisfied with your, your career or not. For example, I'm asking you, it's too late for me now, but I'm asking you young people, are you satisfied and happy with your own career as a scientist, as a researcher? Has it ever cropped up in your mind that I should be something else? <laughs> By the way, it's not too late, you know. Life is an experiment. You can always uh, leave one career to a better career if you like. But if the answer is yes, so stick to the word of uh, Novak Djokovic. He said that uh, if yes, then your recurrent doubt must be override by your commitment. So that sticks to my mind. You know, when you have commitment, then go ahead, do it, even though you have doubt from time to time. <clears throat> okay, talk about talk about education. Um, fortunate enough, like a, um, in the introduction that. I got my uh, basic education from Western Australia and also from Wisconsin under the sponsorship of the uh, Rockefeller Foundation and Colonel Pan Scholarship. By the way, I'm, I'm a, a medical student to start with and then I was recruited by Professor Stang who started the <laughs> Faculty of Science because of the uh, preclinical uh, setting up there to go and uh, you know, uh, do inside rather than medicine. But, but, uh, I don't regret it. It's a, a very rewarding career. And also, I have a, a stint as postdoctoral training and sabbatical leave at uh, UCLA and also uh, at the, the Medical Research Institute at New Hill in the UK. So that uh, sort of sharpened my skill a little bit. So, so what, what, what do you get from going abroad as a postdoc and also as a as a uh, visiting professor on sabbatical leave. I think that that's very essential to, to build your, your character and to hone your skills. And so find time to go abroad for this purpose because it uh, really provides time for deep concentration in research with little or no distractions and time to do specific area of research apart from your own. 
and time to learn more and do more research in a new area that we will add new dimension or perspective to your whole area of research. And of course, time to gain scientific credibility through publication and build up a good CV. And most of all, time to think quietly and do think independently. I think that's very important for everybody. And so hopefully you have good education, good training, and build up your technical skill. I think there are three basic skills that you need to develop to lead the team of research. Uh, that is the technical and laboratory skill that will enable you to design, perform, oversee experimentation, and informatic skill. Uh, there's so much explosion of knowledge nowadays that you need this skill to search through literature, to update, to manage yourself. And uh, Dr. Surin also emphasized the communication skill. And that is so true for scientists as well. Reading, listening, writing, speaking, language skill, especially in English, which is a lingua franca the working language for science, for humanities, and for social science as well, and especially in the ASEAN community, that will allow you to win grant, publish your paper, and also networking with your overseas collaborators especially. And third element is self-improvement and self-learning. I think this is important because um, beyond certain level, nobody can teach you. You know, it's all in the, in the uh, phone or tablet uh, that you have. And Dr. Surin also uh, mentioned this uh, very well. And, and I think uh, you have to be excited and keep a breath with academic and technological advance all the time, even though as old as I am, I'm still excited by scientific publications and uh, breakthroughs and so on and so forth. And uh, so Dr. Surin also uh, illustrated that very well, even though he's in uh, social science humanity, you know, uh, about the, the attractiveness of a new discovery. Uh, so uh, I start out, uh, to be frank, in one dimension in my research. You know, at the 1970s, a time to study cell biology through cell structure and also some degree cell function, mainly through, through electron microscopy. So I did that, I uh, devote my whole three or four year on studying uh, lymphoid cells. Some of you may know the Peyer's patch, the histophysiology of Peyer's patch, and particularly the, uh, the cell which we call follicular dendritic cells, which is in the lymph node. Uh, some of you may know that this is a very important cell which uh, process antigen and add it on to the, the uh, T cell and so on and so forth. Now, which is being exploited in cancer immunotherapy. Okay, so uh, I think uh, you have to widen your horizons instead of being single dimension. You need to, to be multiple dimension because uh, to study biology in particular nowadays, you need to appreciate system biology, genomics, proteomics, the style of understanding genes, and the style of understanding protein structure and function, and put them in totality, you know, which I call the word celomic myself. Celomic is the understanding of proteomic and uh, genomic in the context of cell structure and function. You have to categorize cell over 250 kind of cell in our, our body now through gene expression rather than through just picture, just the uh, micrograph of the cells, and you have to correlate uh, the cell differentiated state with the type of protein they produce and visualize protein interaction distribution, so on and so forth. In short. Without correlating structure, I realize that without, without correlating structure with gene and protein, the pretty picture that I made has become more meaningless. So I need to widen my horizon, make it more 
uh, you know, multiple dimension. And I also realize, and every, everybody now probably has to realize that uh, genomics and proteomics will be the future base of middle science practice as anatomy and physiology and pathology used to be. And we have to teach our young medical students to appreciate the size of genomics and proteomics in the context of uh, human structure and function and disease. And in particular, I said about uh, my excitement in technical development, you know, in studying uh, genomic and proteomics. In my own particular field, I thought that it's uh, leading to the blind in studying electron microscopy and uh, picture of cells, categorized cell by year. But uh, I almost gave up. But suddenly in 1990, you know, uh, the new science was born. And this is the science of cryo-electron tomography of nanoparticles, where people can take uh, even single particle at low temperature and then use computer program to build up the three dimension. So that's a bridge between X-ray diffraction and electron microscopy. You can fit uh, the shape of a protein uh, with a peptide backbone into the whole particle. In other words, you see 3D, almost a real life 3D. And also, uh, also in particular is the uh, image <coughs> mass spectrometry which come into my field very recently. You know, in mass spec, you uh, bombard the specimen and break up the uh, compound into small pieces, whether it be proteins, uh, lipids, or carbohydrates. And then um, most of them will be charged. And you run that particle to electric field or magnetic fields, and then you get spectrum of mass per charge of particle. And you can identify that particle not only that, nowadays you could do it on section, you know, whether it's uh, even paraffin section, and then draw the picture of the distribution of that particular type of molecules on the picture, on the section of the organs. So I, I think this would be the mainstay of pathologic diagnosis in the future. So uh, also I'm excited by this. Actually, it's uh, called chemical microscopy and it's come very strong. All right, and uh, the last one of the three is the bioinformatic. I don't need to elaborate on this. Just to emphasize that it is very important. Uh, it is a main key for understanding and analyzing and applying proteomics. Without it, you cannot uh, make sense of a proteome. Uh, our DNA sequencing technology has improved vastly according to Moore's law, you know. We could uh, decipher uh, DNA sequence um, through the so-called new generation sequencing technique. Every 18 months, uh, we could double the capacity of uh, sequencing. And eventually, it's hoped that everybody will have their own identity through uh, his or her own DNA fingerprinting, you know, which uh, is hoped that it could be done with a uh, under Hundred U.S. dollar per exome for individual, for individual. So needless to say, we we come very far in terms of uh, genomics and proteomics, and we have software to analyze, uh, to make sense of protein, to compare protein, to reconstruct the TD, and also even to predict the the structure and function. My whole point about this is that uh, as a young researcher you should try to move from single to multiple dimension and from monodiscipline to multidiscipline even though you may not understand it in depth but you should know uh, what it is what it's good for when you become leader of the group you have to be able to see all what kind of technique you need to use what kind of partner you want to recruit into your team and of course uh, the future is, uh, is the key. And uh, everybody is talking about precision medicine. Uh, what does it mean? Um, basically what it means is that maybe from a few years on from now, uh, the therapy, 
uh, even prevention of disease, uh, could be drawn to the curtails, could be tailored to a uh, specific individual genome. For example, you know, uh, cancer could be categorized to the specific type of uh, mutation. So uh, you can also give a drug to patient uh, through very specific chemicals and to fit your genomic type. So I think this is uh, coming very fast through our understanding of basic research in genomics and proteomics. And uh, the fourth aspect, I think, uh, in my experience, is to formulate research problem and research team. I have said that uh, being single dimension doesn't take you very far. You have to uh, be able to acquire partner you cannot do it yourself, which can, you cannot do, obviously. Uh, to do research problems which are multi-discipline, multi-dimension, and that can be acquired only through uh, teamwork and network, all right? So that you can, what I said, making wave, make it important, make it more relevant. Uh, I'm quite lucky in the way, you know, to have friends so friends in your faculties, in your universities, are very important indeed. Not only for social gathering, but uh, you could talk to each other and you know, find out what they are doing and what are their expertise. And then they could become your collaborator. I have a fantastic friend and collaborator. Some of you may know him, Professor Shitusan Sawadivat. Uh, Professor Longwood Tan Pajit, who is now working in uh, Canada, and myself. We have done very basic research to start with, you know, when, uh, when we were young. When we are very brave and you are young, you are very brave. You propose a sort of uh, out of this world, out of this box research. We propose uh, a grant to Ford Foundation to study the organization of human sperm chromatin. That is very really brave, you know, because that is the foremost subject that. Uh, in Thai, we call Tang Se Pan, <laughs> the path of tiger. <laughs> How can you hope to compete with uh, people who are more ready than you in the Western world? What, what we did is somehow we got grant and we did some work which are highly cited you know, in experimental cell research and so on. And we study the effect of gossip hall. Uh, at that time, it was a popular subject, you know, because we are concerned with uh, population control. You know, 30 years back, uh, you know, it's only what. Uh, it's exploding. Six billion people, we are very scared. We, we are afraid of Malthusian uh, theory that the uh, world will be over and with a human spe species. We are still afraid, you know, but not so much. And now we have a lower birth rate in Japan, in Western world, even in Thailand. You know, we have to import labor from Burma, from Cambodia, and so on and so forth. And that's a social problem. Anyway, uh, because of these, uh, you know, in work, uh, subject and uh, population control, we got grant to do human research, uh, human reproduction research, including the organization of human sperm chromatin. All right. So these two of my friend and colleague have been a great contributor. Uh, we will still remain uh, you know, friends, good friends, uh, 30, 40, 40 years later. So if you are work together and uh, your chemistry match, then it's a long life rewarding experience. You know. So don't sit in your corner alone. You have friends and collaborators. <clears throat> and uh, the fifth aspect is that no matter what kind of uh, PhD you got, you know, uh, if you are able to, uh, like I said, uh, making yourself more of the multidimensional, multidimensional, then you, you, you can easily morph your knowledge and your technique to be involved in uh, to solve relevant local or global problem, research problem. I call this a research niche. You know, if you are very basic scientist, you got a degree, especially from abroad, for example, you are good at certain technique. You need to look at local problem. 
and see whether you can morph. Uh, you know, the word morph is a modern word. I hope <laughs> it's actually transform is more 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 uh, more uh, boring word, but uh, morphing. Young people know. You, know, you morph yourself into a certain thing and morph your skill into doing research which are more relevant to your uh, your local problem and also make global problem. Just to put it in, in, in perspective, you know, I have morphed myself from studying human sperm chromatin, very basic research, you know, into uh, the reproduction of abalone crustacean and now sea, sea cucumber, because these species are very valuable for food and for medicines. So I look at the uh, neuroendocrinology of reproduction of these um, lower species, you know, even though my basic training uh, is in human, but it's not uh, impossible. And in fact, it's very enjoyable. And uh, if you believe in evolution, and now I even go into the uh, the studying the benefit, nutraceutical benefit and pharmaceutical benefit of product from uh, against aging and cancer from sea cucumber uh, chemical, which are known to be very potent anti-aging and also anti-cancer. And also from studying just very basic uh, histophysiology of pages patch, I think I, I, have been, I have morphed myself into studying the neglected uh, tropical disease like schistosomiasis and fasciolosis in terms of the immunodiagnosis, vaccine, and therapeutics. So, mm, you know what I mean? You, you, if you, you are broad in your horizon, you can morph yourself to certain things and be involved in the local scene. And the sixth aspect is to build up teamwork and network, whether it's local or international. Uh, I'm also very lucky in terms of uh, uh, be able to build up both local and international uh, with my colleague of the same generation. You know, Professor Stacia Sauer is a well, well known. Uh, Authority on the GNIH, the neuro endocrine of uh, land prey, of a uh, very low, uh, low vertebrate, but it's uh, very important as well in terms of key evolution of GNIH molecules. And Dr. Geoffrey Mercer uh, from Canada is an expert in crustacean behavior. So I have, I have been able to connect to them. And I also have young friend, you know. Not my age, but they are in uh, the 40, uh, in the 30, who are coming up very fast. Uh, like uh, Professor Mitsutoshi Seto, who is uh, an expert on mass spectrometry and also imaging mass spectrometry. And also Dr. Scott Kamin, who is a bioinformaticist in Australia. Uh, how do I come up with this? You just have to be a little bit thick skinned when you go to. <laughs> to the meeting, you know, uh, and don't just go to sizing, but listen to the key uh, keynote speaker, and uh, then after the session, and introduce yourself, introduce your research problem, and then you know, make connection. And, uh, also, it helps to have student, PhD student. I've been uh, fortunate to have um, about 20 uh, PhD student from RGJ scholarship. So that's a good means for making connection to student and collaboration. And again, I think about the old word you know, that, that uh, people are saying in English. Uh, you remember? An old dog could never learn how to do a new trick. That's what they say. <laughs> right? But I, I think, uh, but he can always befriend a young dog to do the trick for him. So make, make uh, friends with young people, uh, not only of your generation. And of course, older people, if you are younger, use them as mentor, and that also help. And hopefully, uh, you build up team, you build up network, which means that you have now manager skill. The leader of a big team is almost like a CEO, you know, like in a uh, developed country, one, one research team could be close to 100 sometimes. So you uh, just saying uh, the big company, <laughs> Hundred a person under life in, in, in your in your research team, and you have to be able to manage them, right? So you have to have ability to judge people, 
ability to understand various stereotypes of human being, human behavior, and have patience, of course, diplomacy, good listening skill, readiness to provide necessary support for your team member, and ability to manage people, uh, devising appropriate job description, fitting job, and personality type and training and so on. And, uh, of course, you have to give back as well to, to your team member, especially your uh, junior colleague and graduate student. I think everybody has to have specific goal or job descriptions and uh, KPI for their, their work, you know, the measure of accomplishment, and we can call it job description, PA or PE, whatever you, you have designed now, you know, in your quality control. It has to be done in the group. And uh, make everything a learning opportunity. So lab meeting is a must. Every two weeks, every month, at least. And then a group conference and symposium is also um, very essential. You know, it's a, a little bit more formal when you present uh, your research as a group. And foster uh, force active and independent thinking. Uh, so there had to be a certain degree of democracy in the group, right? Uh, in research and group as well, uh, not just only top-down order. And also uphold professional standard and ethical values is also very important. And allow members to participate in technical and managerial affairs. I uh, <clears throat> asked my student to, to be involved in writing report, you know, to uh, teach technique to others and so on and so forth. The result. So Rabbi, Dr. Surin mentioned that uh, the peer learning is very important. It's a peer learning process. All right, and of course, I'd like to say that without a strong graduate program, especially PhD student, you cannot hope to build a strong research. So um, Burupa University, I think, is upcoming and you need a very strong graduate uh, student uh, and program. Uh, okay, uh, I have to run to it uh, faster now. And then uh, the seventh point I like to make is that you have to be able to understand, uh, like Dr. Surin again, you know, referred to me several times, which I'm very honored. I hope he become a prime minister. <laughs> 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 that in high politics, you know. But he un understand the value, uh, value chain of research and research output. Right? To, to put it briefly in uh, research, uh, even though uh, we, we, uh, we are not supposed to divide it into uh, division. Uh, it's a very uh, blur eye, really. But um, you know, for discussion sake and for analytical sake, we, we say uh, research divided into four compartments. The basic research, which acquire knowledge, basic knowledge, and strategic or targeted basic research, which have goal being set by funding agency especially, your university especially, and also uh, apply or translational research and development, which is a prototype development, engineering, processing, so on, making product, so on. So uh, as a researcher, you have to be able to understand where you fit into this context, whether you want to do basic research apply research or uh, development research, apply research. But actually, uh, you know, if you just started, uh, the appropriate way is to do basic research and then morph yourself gradually into doing more sophisticated uh, uh, strategic basic research and apply research. And eventually, if you build up enough team, you will be able to make things rather than just discover knowledge. Yeah, so you have to be able to understand where you, uh, you fit into this uh, research, value chains, context. And also, you have to understand the KPI. I hope university understand. The country do not understand. They say that publication is worthless. You know, you have to be able to sell product. <laughs> that should be the end of research, right? 
So publication is uh, very essential for yourself, for your university, for ranking, for the world, for civilization, name it. You know, and pattern, very important. Application utilization, that is the cream of uh, the research. If you can do that, it's great. You can't, don't blame yourself. You know, just be true to yourself. And uh, the reason why uh, Dr. Surin said that I'm lamenting on, on, on the understanding of uh, politicians uh, in uh, supporting research is that, uh, you know, uh, the first lie actually is in time, uh, I hope, but I could, I could uh, express it in such a way that normally uh, politician and policy maker in middle income country do not understand the full chain of on full value of a chain of research. They say that uh, research must result in sellable product. Or in Thai, we call it Tong Long Han, Mai Khun Hing. This is a very defeating statement. You know, because I think, I think the, the, the understanding which we all know is that uh, Doing research or supporting research is actually like growing fruit tree. You know, basic research is a root and stem that provides support and enrichment. And that prior research is uh, with yield fruits, it's value added. So if you are on the left side, you are just a monkey. If you are on the right side, okay, you are a proper human being in terms of understanding and supporting research. Okay. And uh, also, we have a lot of uh, debate going on among ourselves, among uh, university, among the uh, policy maker, you know, whether to support research with uh, go to Hing or Han, you know, commercial uh, culture or shelf. But, but I think that's nonsense. Because you have to understand that uh, these are actually a continuous spectrum of things. You know, like, like I try to uh, do my best here in, in terms of uh, drawing, you know. You have to be engaging, especially in university things. In academic research, which is globally relevant and publishable, disseminable, you know, for the reason that I already mentioned, and Dr. Surin mentioned uh, the uh, Newton story about uh, standing on the, step, on the shoulder of giant and so on, so that we could create a uh, uh, body knowledge for human civilizations. So academic knowledge is no obstacle to being utilized. And at the same time, we should also aspire to do what I call uh, socially engaged research. We also owe it to the people, to the taxpayer, that we should also do some locally relevant research problem, if possible, you know, and, and then uh, make it sellable, make it utilizable. So it's not conflicting at all. Uh, so in my view, you know, you could publish in renowned international journal, which should also be encouraged. And at the same time, if that uh, knowledge and that article is applicable to Thai scene, you know, you can publish in local journal and it should be highly regarded as well for people who do not read English as good as you are able to. So I think it, it, served, it has a niche to serve in, in, in the scientific uh, advance. Okay, so uh, that's what uh, I feel. Uh, almost finished now, just a few more minutes. And uh, very important, I think, institutional role and your contribution. Uh, I call it nature, again, nurture. Nature is what it is. Nurture is a thing we are doing together to make it better. You know, so, so we have to be able to, to do both. And a good research institute and university, in addition to having physical facility, infrastructure, should also create environment and culture to support research. Don't ever talk about, you know, you are doing research and you, your benefit from research, you know, from people who are doing only teaching. 
Yeah, I think my uh, um, the role of uh, professor in university is to do both teaching and research at the same time, so that you can have a kind of a research led teaching that is the most effective way of promoting education for young people especially. So research must be integrated with teaching and reward accordingly. And everybody must share responsibility and contribute to the fostering of this seen and unseen culture and environment and make it worse. Okay, because you are part of the organization. And my last point is that you have to know the Thailand research funding policy, you know, as a young aspiring researcher. And uh, you know where the money is coming from, it's very important, what kind of thing that uh, they want you to do in research. And also research direction of the country, and your university is very important. Uh, and then find where and which way you could fit in, fit your research in. Well, it's very unfortunate that, uh, you know, in Thailand, we just have too many research funding organization, policy making. Uh, we have the habit of uh, you know, setting up new organization if the old one doesn't work. <laughs> uh, what I put it in Thai, you know, uh, this is the characteristic of our research funding organization. We have so many of them. You know, Wo Cho, Wo Wo, Sokoo is an old institute, very uh, bureaucratized, hard to change, <laughs> as you, can, you know. Yeah. And then uh, it doesn't work. So after the uh, coup, and then we have uh, His Excellency Anand Penderechun to lead the government uh, installed by the coup. Then we have uh, so uh, we have Sokoo Cho, Nasda, yeah. and Sokoo and so on and so on and so on. So because it's supposed to be working uh, better than the organization. And now everybody is uh, claim that they are doing great work. That's a problem with the research funding agency. They expand their footprint. And they say that, you know, every time uh, they have to defend budget, and they have to defend with the, the, the uh, MP and the parliament, they said that you must have something to show them that could be sell, could be sold, or could be used in the local <laughs> locality. How could you do that? You know? So everybody uh, clamoring for uh, the, the so-called the, 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 the sellable research <laughs> at the cost of supporting basic research, good basic research. I think that's very unfortunate. That's why we cannot get across the middle income gap country. Okay, but never mind, you know, uh, you are small, I am small, what can you do? Let them find out, <laughs> find it out like they use uh, Article 44 now, right, I mean, uh, to, to do the uh, reorganization, but I, I, I think they, they, they haven't done enough. They just manipulate, uh, consolidate the, the national committee, but that's not enough. I think they need to prune and to lose it. But for our our part of it, you know, never mind, as long as they have money and they have, uh, you know, project for us, whether it be uh, strategic or not, and we, we should be ready to grab the money and do research and also be true to it and make it work in terms of um, knowledge and also application, I think. And uh, believe it or not, this government come up with this ten super cluster again, everybody know. And, but nobody know how it's going to be administered, you know, they're going to be in the, the, the what they call the research and industrial linkage group, you know. but, but I name them, and then you may have a scouting from your university and see where you can fit in you know, and get the money. And uh, lobbying is a way of life, I think, in Thailand and also in, in, in abroad. All right, so I finish my lecture by uh, using this slide. <laughs> Um, uh, some of you, many of you may have seen this already. It's a sort of satirical cartoon from a Japanese a middle manager who worked in Thailand for quite a while. Uh, he's, uh, you know, he compared, you could see the uh, picture by and, and understand by yourself. The upper part is the Japanese way of doing things. 
The lower part is a high way of doing things. We are easy going, we are smiling. But, but don't get me wrong, you know, uh, that's, that's why it makes our culture, our physiognomy, uh, our character so attractive to, to foreigners, to Europeans, to uh, Scandinavians who are so serious, have no fun in life. You know, really, really the value from uh, tourism is uh, hundred billion uh, beyond, uh, even trillion. And uh, we, we cannot overlook that. But at the same time, we, have, we should be more serious uh, in our character in doing things, especially in research. And we are in the same boat, so we have to try to roll and make our best. And then uh, take into our heart the, the, the speech by the king. Uh, Rurak Samaki, I think that's the key to it. <laughs> Love and unity, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the nice talk and thank you very much for making, uh, making us lots of motivation. And now I would like to open for the questions or if you have any ideas to share with us. Yes, please. Hi, thank you very much for that interesting talk. It's nice to get some experience from those experienced researchers and so um, You mentioned about moving from one dimensional to uh, multi discipline How would you use this? <laughs> Hello? Uh, okay. Um, and morphing your knowledge as you develop into new research fields. I was wondering if you could maybe elaborate a bit on how we actually do that. Um, when we come out from a PhD, often it's easy to feel boxed in to the things you already know and the experience you have. So how do you actually morph your knowledge and uh, become multi-directional? Well, uh, you know, of course we have to be able to do self-learning that I mentioned, you know. Um, the Wikipedia is a great source. And scientific uh, paper on uh, review and then uh, another very effective way of doing it is that uh, you have to have to be a student of your student. Like uh, I send my student to learn mass spectrometry and imaging mass spectrometry with a Pochi, my young colleague in Japan. And I follow them and I learn from them. You know, so uh, that's why I think I, 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 I uh, broaden my horizon by my enthusiasm and instinct that uh, I like to learn more and gain more. In other words, uh, it's an education that uh, you don't have to be able to uh, do it yourself alone. Learn it through students as well. <laughs> That's one mechanism. that you know where to find the money right, for yeah. the research. Yes. But uh, from my experience, uh, I like to do research. I, I, I don't care about where to find the money, and I'm not very good at that. Okay, I think a lot of researchers are like me. So shouldn't the university have a strategy or set up some, uh, some process so that, or organization which help researchers to just focus on their research work. Don't have to go and try to sell their ideas or try to find money for their research. And get rid of all the red tapes and, and you know, uh, ridiculous regulations. For example, recently I requested to go to a, uh, a international conference to present my paper. And the staff at the faculty said that, uh, why do you have to stay three or four days? You know, it took me two days to travel and two days for the conference. <laughs> and you want me to stay one day only, you know, for this trip. The purpose of attending an international conference for studying other people, research, and uh, getting some new ideas. And this kind of thing really discouraged people uh, who are 
uh, who lack research, doing research, because they want to uh, uh, disseminate their, their work and maybe exchange ideas with other people, but then you, you, you have this kind of regulations, and you know, you have to explain to the person that. Now, I'm going there to learn also, not just to present my ideas, okay? And, and this is some example that shows that the university must have an organization to support people who <coughs> want to do research and find grants or some money to help them to accomplish their work. I understand that, for example, in, in uh, American University, the president is like a, a, a person who try to get as many as grants as possible and then distribute them to the researchers in the university. Now, that way, you have a lot of uh, research result coming out. You get people who have to uh, stick to the uh, quality assurance, you know, a lot of paperwork, and then you have to have research, and uh, you have to be uh, uh, evaluated according to many criteria. You know, I think this is impossible, and really, really a big obstacle to research uh, advance in the university. What, what, <laughs> do you have any suggestion for university? Maybe some university should revamp their research yes. process okay. and organization. Yeah. I, I understand your point, that's always a dilemma. <laughs> yeah, but but uh, uh, you are probably uh, not, not in scientific field. <laughs> what we are you in? In humanities or in language? Oh, for me? Yes. Oh, I'm in uh, logistics. Yes, logistics. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm a scientist, you know. Uh, to do research now, they cost money. And uh, you know, they have a very limited resource. And, and uh, so if you want to do a research, either you go to the funding agency to get a bigger money, bigger grant, or to a private company that's under the source. Uh, which could uh, support us, but our research must be geared toward solving the problem. Uh, I think that's a fair and square, you know, the um, good example is Stanford University, which could get money from government, like you said, block grant, big block grant from government, you know, uh, from funding agency government and doing uh, the, the infrastructure build up and also maybe supporting researchers to do what they like uh, and uh, you know, so get benefit. Uh, get patent even. You know. Also, the, the professor could also have, have to work on their own in, as a group to contact the company like Silicon Valley and get um, research fund to do the commercial oriented research. And that's an excellent example of university you know, doing research in the context of both uh, teaching and research and make it uh, a spinning wheel, money spinning wheel. So that's a big situation. But I, I sympathize with the Thai University because uh, it, it's uh, limited in terms of resource. Uh, I agree and urge that for beginning uh, researcher, like new researcher, you know, who just got a PhD not more than five years, and then um, should be support to start their research activity, which I think uh, many universities, including Burpa, are doing that. Uh, the money could be small, but it could be provide a sort of startup fund uh, of research. But that for, for older person, you know, uh, I don't know whether university can support or not, especially if you have more activity. So I think we, we, we are duty bound as well to, to go out and, and, and uh, resourcing the fund from outside. And I think uh, logistic is a should be easy for you to find money <laughs> for, for your own research. So uh, my answer is that, yes, uh, users should have system of support, but um, perhaps it could not uh, unlimited support, and we also have to do our job in getting our own research funding. Thank you. Okay, um, I think we have time for one more question. Yes. Before we have dinner lunch, I would like to announce for the dinner party, welcome party tonight. 
We have the theme is, as I remember, the theme is night blooming flowers, right? So, <laughs> if possible, flowers. you should dress up like uh, flowers or beautiful like uh, flowers or something. Okay. And for the lunch, uh, we will be available at the Cascades restaurant, which is downstairs. You turn left, left, and go downstairs. And okay. Last but not least, we wish you a productive conference and help hope you enjoy uh, your time at the conference. And of course, enjoy your meal. Thank you very much.